Welcome to our continuing 2020 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. We help you manage every aspect of a compliance program and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Steve Wilder, Senior Consultant and COO of Sorensen Wilder and Associates with us today. Steve has spent the past 35 years in healthcare safety, security, and risk management. He has provided consultation services to hundreds of clients, including hospitals, long-term care, home care agencies, clinics, physician practices, and pre-hospital EMS services. Steve has performed security vulnerability assessments and mock OSHA audits in over 300 healthcare facilities over the United States and has trained thousands of workers in workplace safety and security. An experienced trial expert, Steve consults for law firms and insurance companies on issues of healthcare safety, security, non-clinical risk management, aggression management, and workplace violence. He also has written numerous articles for healthcare magazines and trade journals. He and his partner, Chris Sorensen, are co-authors for the book, The Essentials of Aggression Management in Healthcare, From Talk Down to Take Down. Steve also writes for a monthly safety column for a long-term living magazine. In 2010, they introduced their Essentials for, of Aggression Management training program in hospitals designed to train healthcare professionals to de-escalate aggression behavior before it becomes violent and to manage physical aggression in ways that protect both the caregiver and the patients while remaining cognizant of patient rights. Today, that program is being used in hospitals across the nation. Steve is the founding member and past president of the Illinois Society of Healthcare Risk Management and also served two years on the Education Committee for the American Society of Healthcare Risk Management. He earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from Governor State University in University Park, Illinois. He is the board certified healthcare safety professional and holds certifications in CFATS and HCEP uh, with the United States Department of Homeland Security. Steve also spent 35 years in the fire service and is a retired fire chief in the suburbs of Chicago. In 2018, Steve was the recipient of the Illinois Security Professionals Association Award for Emergency Preparedness Leadership. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Let's see. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will come directly from PACOM and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There is no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. A download of the handout is available with a button on the bottom right hand side of your screen. So, Steve, a very warm welcome. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. It's great to be back working with uh, you folks again. I always enjoy working with First Healthcare Compliance. Uh, and I always look forward to, to the opportunity to, to partner up with you guys. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, we're living in a really tough time right now. I think uh, everybody, you know, one of the commonalities coast to coast, corner to corner of this great nation is that everybody's at their wit's end. And we've been affected by this COVID thing in ways that none of us had ever imagined possible. And one of the things that we have to start thinking about as we start to reopen our country uh, piece by piece is what's it going to look like when we start going back to work 
Now, we did a program last year, Catherine, you'll recall, on uh, the armed intruder and the active shooter in the healthcare facility. And the response from your uh, listeners was excellent. And, and again, I thank you for that opportunity. Uh, so we're going to talk about that again today. Uh, we're going to use much of the same information, but we've sort of updated it uh, because we need to be thinking a little bit about how we're going to respond in the post-COVID world. Because I think normal, as we once knew it, is a long way away from what it's going to look like moving forward. So we need to think about that a little bit. You know, just for a refresher, when we talk about an active shooter in a facility, it's a person or persons whose activity is immediately intended to cause death or serious bodily injury. It's not contained. There is an immediate risk of death and serious injury to the, to the victims. A couple of things you remember what it's not. It's not a security event. It's not a code gray or a code silver or whatever other ridiculous rainbow color systems you might be using. It's not a person with a weapon. It's not a hostage event. It is an event with deadly threat. So, you know, the consequences are critical. Probably the biggest problem that we still see after all these years now that we've been dealing with and talking about active shooter environments is the mindset that people still have that says it won't happen to me. It will never happen here. And, and gosh, friends, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've gone into facilities and, and doing security vulnerability assessments or, or doing audits or whatever we might be doing for them. And, and we talk about active shooter, and that's the mindset I hear. It won't happen here. And, and I've always just got two very simple words. Why not? And boy, I'll tell you what, the responses I get to that, just absolutely incredible. Um, you know, because oh, we're a small town, everybody knows everybody. Oh, because our, our people love us. Uh, the, our employees think we're fantastic. Our families, our patients, our residents, everybody loves us. And, you know, there's just no valid reason. We got to get our heads out of the sand and realize that as long as we are in the people business, and when I say people business, we're taking care of patients, we're taking care of residents. We've also got staff members coming in. We've also got vendors coming in. We've also got visitors coming in. You know, that list of people that I talk about in the people business goes on and on and on. And we have no way of knowing what's going on inside the mind of every person that walks inside our door. So with that being said, you know, there's other people who thought it would never happen to them. In October 2006, when a gunman walked into that little Amish school building in, uh, in Nickelbines, Pennsylvania, uh, lined those 10 little girls up against the wall with their backs to him and in the most cowardly fashion he could, shot him in the back before he committed suicide. Just literally gunned those little girls down. Uh, no rhyme, no reason to it. Who would have ever thought that something like that could happen in that beautiful Amish community? And I've worked with the Amish, and, and I don't think there is a more gentle, kind, and compassionate culture on God's green earth. And to imagine something like that, when I'm sitting here literally, uh, you know, 14 years later, and I'm still talking about it getting goosebumps because I still can't imagine it happened. But nobody would ever thought it would happen to them. You know, we see shootings in our schools all the time. Uh, somebody said the other day, one of the great things about this COVID shutdown is we haven't had any school shootings. Well, I could think of a lot better ways to minimize the, the chances of a school shooting than to go through something like we're going through as a nation right now. But, you know, nobody wants to think it can happen in their schools. But it's happened in so many schools so many times over the years. Uh, it's just you, you can't say it's not going to happen. Well, who could ever imagine it happening at a senior citizen center? But here we go again. Uh, California, a few years ago, uh, a double murder-suicide. Uh, a resident shot and killed two employees and then shot and killed himself. Nobody ever thought it would happen. In Toledo, Ohio, uh, Director of Activities, and here's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes, because this was the Director of Activities being held hostage at gunpoint inside the facility by her estranged husband. And we're going to talk in a couple of minutes about domestic violence, because we have to address it in the COVID world now. Another Ohio incident, I'm not picking on uh, good folks from Ohio either, one of my favorite states, but uh, they all... Uh, Police arrested the ex-husband of a nurse who was killed in the parking lot of the skilled nursing facility uh, as she got off work and was walking to her car. You know, the ironic thing about this one is she had uh, had an order of protection against him, and 
he violated that order of protection, got arrested. Mommy and daddy couldn't stand the thought of their precious little boy being in jail, so they bailed him out. As soon as he gets home, what does he do? He grabs a gun, and he goes to his wife's place of employment, the nursing home, and he sits in the parking lot and waits for her to walk out to the car. As she's walking out to the car, he gets out of his car, walks up and shoots her, and, and took her life right there. Um, so, again, you know, nobody wants to think it can happen, but there's so many reasons it can. Uh, this is probably one of the first ones in healthcare facilities that I became familiar with, and I'm intimately familiar with this one because I've done so much work with uh, the insurance company for this facility over the years now. Uh, March 29, 2009, uh, in uh, uh, Carthage, North Carolina, at the uh, Pine Lake Health and Rehab Center, an individual is served with divorce papers. His wife is working as a uh, nursing assistant at the facility, and, you know, being served with divorce wasn't something he saw coming in his future. And so he finds solace and comfort uh, with uh, having Sunday morning breakfast with a good friend of his named Jack Daniels. And once he gets a belly full of Jack Daniels, he's got his liquid courage up. He grabs three guns and proceeds to drive to this facility. Uh, his intention is to shoot his wife. Before he does that, though, he sees her car in the parking lot. So he walks over and he fires a few rounds out of a shotgun into his wife's car. Visitor happens to be walking out of the building at that point, looks at him and says, hey, man, what are you doing? Points the gun at the visitor, and he shoots the visitor and hits him in the shoulder. Walks inside looking for his estranged wife. He can't get to her because she's working in the memory care unit, which is a locked unit. And now when he realizes that she's in a locked unit and he can't get to her, he goes into a rage, walks around the facility, uh, shooting residents and employees. And he ended up shooting and killing six residents. Uh, wounding, or excuse me, wounding three others, shot and killed one uh, uh, employee, uh, and by then the local police arrived and uh, he shot one police officer. Uh, that officer was able to return fire and hit him uh, in the shoulder and disable him to the point where the officer was able to uh, uh, get the offender's gun away from him and take him into custody. So, you know, nobody wants to believe, by the way, I talked about a small town. Carthage, North Carolina at that time was about 2,300 people. So, yes, even in small towns, it can happen. As I said, this COVID thing presents a whole new set of circumstances that we have to think about. We are seeing a spike in workplace violence uh, because of this. Um, one of the big ones that law enforcement agencies are dealing with right now is domestic violence. I'm in the suburbs of Chicago. My local police agency has seen a spike of, some have said as high as 800% in domestic violence cases because people are quarantined, they're cooped up, they're together constantly, and you know, the, the situation inside the home just becomes uh, unbelievably tense. Now, put that with those who may have already been in a situation where their spouse or partner has a history of spousal abuse, where their spouse or partner has a history of alcohol or drug abuse, where their spouse or partner has an, uh, a history of child abuse, and you can appreciate the incidence of domestic violence spiking in the homes. You know, interestingly enough, somebody made an argument the other day, said, yeah, but incidence of sexual abuse of kids or domestic abuse of kids is down. Well, the reason it's down is because the kids aren't in school and school teachers are the number one source for, abuse, for reports of child abuse, excuse me, uh, to children and family service agencies. So when the kids aren't in the school, the, the most likely people to report child abuse aren't able to report it. So it only makes sense that we're seeing a spike in domestic violence and a decrease in child abuse cases. Now, that being said, we've also seen, uh, I don't want to say a significant spike, but we've seen an increase in the number of reports that we are hearing from our clients on incidents of domestic violence or potential incidents of domestic violence when the, and I, and I apologize in advance for this, I'm going to sound gender biased here. I don't mean to, I'm just being factual. When the wife is working or the girlfriend is working in the healthcare facility, the spouse or boyfriend or live-in or whomever he is, is accustomed to being at work himself, but is now home uh, playing school teacher, playing Mr. Mom, playing uh, dad, whatever the role may be, totally out of his environment and the stress starts to get to him. We've seen the spike in domestic violence in the homes. We've had reports of the same thing happening where the, the uh, uh, offending partner, if you will, shows up in the workplace. 
threatening domestic violence or threatening acts of violence, not only against the spouse or partner, but also against the coworkers as well, making threats against the staff. Uh, so, you know, th those are a couple new things that we're dealing with, which as employers, as uh, healthcare professionals, we have to be cognizant of, we have to be looking at our emergency operations plans, we have to be looking at our security management plans, and we need to be making sure we're addressing uh, the potential of this. Uh, the last two tie, kind of tie hand in hand as well, that's the active shooter and the disgruntled worker. You know, we have a tremendous number of workers who are furloughed right now. Uh, you know, we if we listen to the major media outlets, uh, we're led to believe that our hospitals are just snowed and we got patients in the hallways and we got patients in the auditoriums and everything else. That may be true as an exception in some urban areas, but for the most part, we're seeing a number of hospitals on a national level whose hallways are almost empty, whose staff have been furloughed, who are working with absolute skeletal staff, uh, just waiting for the uh, okay to start going back to quote, business as usual, end quote. That being said, when we start calling these workers back, my concern is that everybody is expecting, the furloughed workers are expecting to get a phone call and say, hey, uh, it's over, come back to work tomorrow. And it's not gonna happen that way. You know, businesses are going to have to redevelop. Businesses are gonna have to, in some cases, reinvent. And it's not just a matter of, you know, being able to walk over, turn on the light switch, and it's business as usual. So, you know, you're going to have some workers who are furloughed who are going to find out the unpleasant way that even though the company's starting to go back to work, they may not be going back to work right away. They may still be off for a period of time to come, which then starts them wondering, well, why am I getting uh, held back and so-and-so is getting called back to work? So now we start to run into that whole thing with stress. And, you know, remember, guys, when we're talking about uh, stress and we're talking about anger, those are usually the results of fear. I did an article uh, for a uh, uh, publication not too uh, many weeks ago uh, talking about the risk of domestic, or excuse me, I'm sorry, the risk of increases in workplace violence when furloughed workers aren't called back to work. And I had the privilege of working with a very noted uh, uh, psychotherapist and talking about this. And one of the things that she pointed out, and I just mentioned it, and I want to give Dr. Piper full credit. Uh, one of the things that she pointed out was that fear is usually the driving force between anger, rage, stress, all of those things. Fear usually drives those. So one of the first things we have to think about is, you know, how are our workers going to respond? when not everybody comes back to work at the same time, and when some are gonna be forced to stay home even longer than they were anticipating or wanting to. Which leads us to the disgruntled worker. How are we going to deal with that when they start showing up on the doorstep? So, you know, right off the bat, we're identifying here some true HR components as well that a year ago, we didn't even have to talk about when we did this program. How we react is, is you know, almost unpredictable anymore. You know, we always expect people to react in a stellar way during a crisis or a disaster. One of the things I think the COVID environment has done is it's shown us who our superstars are. And I think some may have found out that the people that they thought were their superstars maybe, be, maybe are superstars in day-to-day -day activity, but are not necessarily superstars when the stress is, is becoming unreasonably high. People fail to respond in a crisis situation at times. You know, there, there are circumstances that we as facilities, as we as employers, however you want to say it, contribute to, and there are some that's on the part of the employees as well. On the part of the employee that's responding to the crisis or that has been responding to the crisis, people have that subconscious need for normalcy. They want to do it the way they've always done it. They want things to be the way they've always been, and they can't work well outside of the comfort zone. They have an overwhelming sense of desire. And we see this, we talk about the active shooter. Let's come back to subject here. We see this with the active shooter environment a lot. People, you know, they, they hear the gunshots. They don't want to believe it's gunshots. They want to believe it's somebody setting off firecrackers or a car backfiring or something ridiculous like that that's totally not common to the workplace. But at the same time, they want to deny that it could be the worst imaginable thing that it is. A lot of times they don't understand the scope of the event. They understand that people are scared. They understand that there's something going on, but 
they just shut down. And again, here we go talking, as Dr. Piper said, talking about fear driving this. They're so scared that they don't process normally as, as what we would consider normal for them or for us. So they're unable to comprehend the scope of the event. And, you know, it's always a pleasure to work with my healthcare friends because, you know, we can talk a little bit more about the, the pathophysiology of some of this. When a person starts to, you know, their fear and anxiety levels go up, their heart rate goes way up, their respiratory rate goes way up, their oxygenation levels go way down, and their thought process becomes convoluted because of it. So they don't necessarily comprehend the, the scope of the event as well. And a lot of times they have this optimistic bias. Everything's going to be okay. Don't do anything. Just relax. Everything's going to be okay. Well, sitting back waiting and hoping for the best is not an acceptable outcome. So, you know, there are four examples of human behavior that might allow people to fail to respond. But as I said, we've also got to look at us organizationally because a lot of times we do things that become, uh, it impedes the employee's ability to respond in a crisis. First of all is we don't have the safety culture that we think we have. We oftentimes give safety lip service, but we don't create a true culture of safety. And when I'm talking about a culture of safety, I'm talking about the organization's personality, if you will, when it comes to safety management and safety as a day-to-day -day way of life. You know, I, I hear this all the time when I go in and it ties right in with the uh, the, the second to the last bullet, their poor training. I'll go into a client's site and I'll say, you know, talk to me about your active shooter program. How do you work it? Oh, Steve, we've got a wonderful program. We've got a video that all of our employees have to watch. And, and you know, right there, I'm rolling my eyes in my head and my yippee skippy alarm is going off. Guys, that is not a safety culture. Right? You, you, you can't get by with, with videos and think you're doing a good job of safety. It has to be a way of life. It has to be hands-on. It has to, as the bullet point says, there has to be planning and preparedness. We have to do, just as we did yeah, with the CMS from 2017 when they came out with the emergency preparedness standards, we have to do our hazard vulnerability assessment. We have to make sure our emergency operation plan addresses the, the medium and high hazards, at least, that we identify in the HVA, the hazard vulnerability assessment. And as that last point says there, guys, we have to train and we have to practice. We have to do hands-on as well, and we will talk about that a little bit more as we go. Now, when we talk about our active shooter program, both prior to the COVID world and now in and post-COVID world as well, five key things. You have to build a program, right? You can't watch a video. Don't waste your money buying a video, blah, blah, blah. All right, you have to build a program. Conduct a security vulnerability assessment. Develop your active shooter emergency response plan. Develop an active shooter training program. Train your staff on how to respond and plan for recovery. And we're gonna look at each of those as we go on here. First one is to conduct the security vulnerability assessment. What is a security vulnerability assessment? Security vulnerability assessment is a systematic process that helps you to identify and answer several key questions. First of all, what are the threats? From what and from whom should we as a healthcare facility be protecting ourselves? What are the things that are out there that could put us in harm's way? What are the threats? Neighborhoods we live in, surrounding high-risk businesses, jewelry stores, schools, those kind of places. What's out there that could put us in harm's way? What are the vulnerabilities? What are the chinks in the armor in our own security plan? Where are there dents in that plan that could allow an opportunity to exist? Now, you got to remember, when we have an active shooter, three things have to be present. We have to have the shooter. Shooter has to have potential victims. And the shooter has to have opportunity. We're not going to say, and this is true for any event. I don't care if it's a shooting, a robbery, uh, theft, uh, the domestic violence, uh, workplace violence, whatever. Three things have to be present, a bad guy, a victim, and an opportunity. We can't get rid of the bad guy. He's always going to be there. We can't get rid of the victims. As long as we've got people or property, we've got potential victims. The only thing we can focus on are taking away the opportunities. And that's the opportunity for the bad guy to make us the target. So when I talk about the chinks in the armor, where are those chinks in our security management program that could allow the opportunity to exist? 
see what we're doing here, guys? We're actually, and I tell people this all the time, we're good people thinking like bad people. And that's exactly what we have to do. We have to put ourselves in the minds of an adversary. And every time we go out to a client site and do a vulnerability assessment for them, as a security vulnerability assessment, this is exactly what we're doing. We're putting ourselves in the mindset of an adversary and saying, okay, if I wanted to wreak havoc in this building or against these people, how would I do it? Where's the opportunity for me to do it? If we can identify those proactively, if we can identify those before an event occurs, we're going to be much better off afterwards because there's going to be less opportunity for that event to ever occur. And if it does occur, what are the risks? What are the potential outcomes? And that's what I mean when I use, you know, my background in risk management, I use the word risk in a lot of different contexts. But in this context, when I talk about risk, I'm talking about outcomes. You know, if I smoke cigarettes, I risk lung cancer. If I don't wear a seatbelt, I risk serious injury if I'm in an accident. So when I talk about risks here, I'm talking about outcomes. If the bad guy is able to wreak havoc, what are the potential outcomes? Loss of life, loss of property, injuries, critical injuries to residents, patients, staff, visitors, loss of uh, good standing in the community, loss of my reputation, uh, image, public relations, you know, we can build a long list of the risks, but loss of life is always at the top of that list. So, you know, the security vulnerability assessment helps us answer those questions. Uh, and then we can ask ourselves, what can I do to minimize the vulnerability? How can I fix those chinks in the armor? And when we start fixing the chinks in the armor, we being all of us now, not here saying use us, saying, you know, as an organization, as a facility, the more we can do to minimize those vulnerabilities, the more we do to take away the bad guy's opportunity to wreak havoc at our place. Once I've done that, once I know where those opportunities are at, once I know where those chinks in the armor are at, I take steps to fix them. Uh, then I can start developing an active shooter uh, emergency response plan. Now, as you've heard me say before, guys, I'm not a fan of store-bought stuff. I don't I never advocate, I won't say don't do it, but I never advocate, oh gosh, you can go out on Google and do a Google search and find all kind of good active shooter programs. No, you need an active shooter program that's specific to your facility. And if you're part of a healthcare system and you've got a facility on the south side of the city and a facility on the north side of the city, each of those needs their own because each of them are unique to the other. Each of them has their own unique identifying uh, uh, traits that the other one's not going to have, whether it's differences in neighborhood, differences in patient mix, differences in payer mix, uh, differences in the types of services. Just because we're all part of the ABC health system doesn't mean one plan fits all. It doesn't. We want to make sure that your plan is realistic to the threat. That's why we do the security vulnerability assessment first, because then we identify what the threats are. We can build in what we've done to minimize the threat and fix those chinks in the armor. And we can develop a plan that's realistic to the threat level now that we're dealing with. We know that at times the shooter comes in looking for just one person. I want to find the boss that fired me. I want to find the wife that left me. I'm not here to hurt anybody else. I've got a score to settle with one person. But there's also shooters that come in and all they want is the high body count. They want the high casualty count. These are the Columbine high schools. These are the... Uh, Sacramento, California. These are the ones, uh, you know, all the school shootings that we hear. Uh, you know, there's just such a long list. Uh, Sandy Hook, uh, you know, a long list of events that have happened over recent years where the shooter is not looking for anybody specific. He's looking for everybody specific. They want a high casualty count. Now, one of the things you have to realize is you're developing your plan. This is the one plan in your emergency operation plan where nobody's going to be coming running. Ah, code red, here comes the emergency response brigade. Code blue, here comes the code team. Code whatever, and I don't like color codes. You may have sensed that by now. But there's not going to be a code team responding because this is the code where when the stuff starts to happen, instead of people running in to help, people are running the other way. They're getting away from you. Right? That's why one of the reasons I don't like color codes. We've got so many colors now that it's easy to confuse them. And there's no uniformity amongst healthcare facilities. None of the regulatory agencies have come out with a standard on this. All right. So for my facility where I work full time, a code silver could be an armed intruder. But then at the other facility where I work part time, a code silver can be an elopement. 
So I get my two codes can cr cross over when one happens, and they call it code silver, and I think, oh, it's an elopement. And I go walking into the hot zone right in the middle of an active shooter event. Shouldn't have happened. So I'm a big fan of plain English. Those of you who are familiar with the incident command system, whether it's hospital incident command systems, nursing home incident command systems, assisted living incident command systems, school incident command systems, it doesn't matter. We don't use any kind of codes. Now you're getting lectured by a former fire chief. We use plain English. You know, in the fire service, we're not even supposed to say 10-4 anymore. Police aren't supposed to say 10-4. We're supposed to say, okay, plain English, guys, as much as you can do, eliminate the potential for miscommunications. you got to realize, too, whenever you've got a shooter in the building, it's going to be chaotic. People are scared for their lives. People are worrying about themselves. They're thinking about their families. They're thinking about their coworkers. Uh, you can practice all you want, and I encourage you practice, 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 but chaos is still going to reign. And you're sitting in your office when all this breaks loose. It may be you or just you and a colleague to get through this alive. And that's why the planning is so important. That's why I'm so big. Do your security vulnerability assessment, then develop your plan. And, and my gosh, we have to. Um, when you're developing your plan, you know, we think about our patients, we think about our residents, and, and, and God bless them, God bless us, we have to. But we have to think about our employees also. OSHA's out there. And OSHA says, you've got to think about your employees in your active shooter plans, right? So we have to develop that plan, not only with our residents or our patients in mind, but with our employees in mind as well. And remember, denial is a river in Egypt. You can't deny that the risk of this is present. This is a risk that's present everywhere. We haven't heard anything about it lately because of COVID. But I promise you, as COVID goes away, this is going to come back. I'm sad to say that. I'm sorry to say that, but I'm being honest with you. We want to make sure we develop our plan, too, with a survival mindset. Talk in your written plan. Where are the exits in each part of the building? Where are the hiding places on each floor, on each wing, in each section? What are the barriers I can use to secure the facility? What are the things I can do to secure doors that aren't meant to be secured, such as fire doors, smoke compartment doors, those things? What are the weapons of opportunity that I have in case I have to protect or defend myself? These are great things I'd like to see you include in your plan because these are things that if we include them in our plan, then we include them in our exercises, now the employees will start to remember it. See why I don't like the video-based training, guys? You watch a video that somebody made at some random building somewhere in the world. It's not for you. It needs to be for you. This needs to be specific to your facility. After we've developed our plan, and again, develop your plan specific to you. I'm not going to quit harping on that. Develop your plan specific to you guys, to your facility. Then I want you to start thinking about your training program. Same thing applies with, the, with developing your training program. Develop your training program specific to your facility. Develop your training program specific to your plan. Don't put it in a position where you've got a training program that says we're going to do this and a plan that says do something else. You get that situation when you buy it off the shelf. You can go out and do a Google search on active shooter training programs, and they're going to send you, you know, you spent 429 bucks, they're going to send you a program. It's going to have CDs, it's going to have videos, blah, 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 and it's not going to do you a bit of good. All right? You need an active shooter training program that's written specific to your plan. Otherwise, when you test your plan, when you do exercises and drills, how are you going to know if your plan works if your training isn't consistent with your plan? I do want you to realize, though, we need to provide our occupant, or excuse me, I'm sorry, we need to provide our people with a range of options and choices. We don't want to say, if there's an active shooter, do this. And that doesn't work. So we don't know where the shooter is. We don't know how the shooter's circumstances are going to vary. We want to provide them with a range of options. Right? Help them to make good decisions. Help them know what the options are available. We'll look at those in a minute. Right? But please realize, guys, Survival is not a random outcome. All right? If you're going to rely on a random outcome, all you're hoping for is luck. That's the luck to you. Survival is a result of training and preparedness. And we look at our training approach. I want you to take that for start with awareness level. Make people realize, yeah, we, we know the risk is there. There's great things. You've got domestic violence programs. You've got a workplace violence preparedness program. And acclimate your employees to all these different programs. Then you can go in. After you've done awareness, you start talking about your preparedness level what you're doing in terms of developing a plan and a training programs. Then we can go in and start doing, you know, we do the training under preparedness. Then we go in and we do our drills and our exercises. 
Now, there's three different types of exercises. I want you to start with a tabletop. Tabletop exercise, that's just basically your leadership team and your policy manual. A tabletop exercise is intended to test your policy, your plan, not your people. Right? You're going to create an imaginary situation, and you're going to follow your plan and see how it works in that imaginary situation. You think you've written a really good plan, I promise you're gonna find glitches in it. And that's good, because this is a nice, no risk, controlled circumstance to find that out. All right, once you've gotten done with the tabletop, then you can go to functional exercises and full scale exercises. That's a little bit more than we need to get into at this point, uh, but, but it's something we can talk about. We'll do a future program, perhaps, on setting up drills and exercises. But then at the end of it, I want you to evaluate, how did we do? This is not an exercise in patting ourselves on the back, friends. This is an exercise that's saying, okay, here's where we could have done better. How can we improve? Because every time we identify a way to improve and do better, we lessen the chances of a bad outcome. You know, don't be afraid of exercises, guys. Everybody, oh, we don't want to do an active shooter exercise. We don't want to scare anybody. Well, you know, I fly all across the country in a non-COVID world. Flight attendants, every time I'm on a flight, they make they remind me uh, what to do if there's an emergency. You know, here's the exits, here's how the door works, here's how the chutes work, here's how a seatbelt works. Right? They're not doing that to scare me out of flying. They're doing it to make sure that I'm prepared if there is an event. And that's why we train our people. That's why you do fire girls, for heaven's sakes. Not that we're anticipating a fire, but to make sure that our people are prepared just in case there ever was one. Now, I talked about options. For healthcare facilities, we have, we advocate uh, a program that's called the Four Outs. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Run, Hide, Fight. And Run, Hide, Fight is a fantastic program, fantastic program. But even the Department of Homeland Security, who developed Run, Hide, Fight, has said it's not for everybody, right? Places it's not for are places where you have to think about more than yourself. I'm in an office building. If there's an armed intruder in this building, I can worry about myself. My uh, office manager can worry about herself. My business partner can worry about himself. My vice president can worry about himself. Uh, you know, everybody in this building is an adult, fully capable of focusing on their own self-survival and preservation. In a healthcare environment, we don't have that luxury. In our hospitals, we got patients who are non-ambulatory, who may be medicated, all kinds of different potentials where they can't take care of themselves. Same thing in the long-term care world. We've got residents in our facilities who are in there for one very simple reason, and that is because they can't care for themselves. So we have to think about them as well. So what we did a number of years ago, and this time um, we're very proud of this program, it has become kind of a, a national model uh, for long-term care facilities and becoming more and more popular with hospitals as well. We call it the four outs. And guys, we're no smarter than the average bear. What we've done is we've basically taken run, hide, fight, and we put it on steroids. All right, the four outs, get out, which is basically the same as run, under run, hide, fight, interior, exterior, evacuation. Hide, which is hide, just like run, hide, fight, avoid protection, you can't get out. This is the one we've added, though, keep out. You know, uh, in a healthcare facility, the luxury, and you saw it on a slide previously, I didn't mention it because I knew I'd mention it here, but, you know, the difference between us and the hotel is the hotel allows you to put a lock on your door. Hospital rooms, resident rooms, we don't get that luxury. We don't have locks on the doors. So we have to come up with alternate ways that we're going to put up barricades or obstructions so the perpetrator can't get in. And the fourth one is take out. What I'd like to do is, is, is keep on moving here, talk about training for a couple minutes. Then we're going to look a little bit more at the four outs. Right, when you talk about training, guys, training has to be multi-level. Now, everybody has to go is what that means. I'm sorry, Mr. Administrator, you're busy. I understand that, but you're going to the training, sir, ma'am. If you have an event, I promise you, and I'm very blessed. I've got a gentleman who's one of my vice presidents here at the office who has spent 15 years with OSHA, 10 years as a compliance training, or excuse me, uh, 10 years as a compliance field officer, five years as a trainer at the OSHA Training Institute, training other compliance officers. And he'll tell you straight up, the first thing that he will do if you have an event when he gets there, is he's going to ask to see your training records. And he's going to want to see that every employee. And the first thing he's looking for is administrative. He's looking for the folks from the C-suites. He knows that the nursing staff and the maintenance staff and the security staff and the housekeeping folks, they've all gone through the training. 
He wants to see if the folks in the C-suite went through it. Because if they didn't, now what we have is a facility that does not have a multi-level training program that OSHA requires. Right? The other thing, too, though, think about your employees. They go through the training. They go through the exercises. They are become intimately familiar with the plan. And now there's an event. All of a sudden, they're there springing into action, doing what the plan calls for. And you have somebody, and I don't mean this with any disrespect, folks in C-suite get, get busy. I understand. I'm in the C-suites for our company. But you didn't participate in the training, but now your people are all looking at you for leadership. How are you giving them that leadership if you don't even know what the training consists of? And again, as I said, provide the options and choices. That's what the four outs is all about. Now, when we talk about training, you know, realize, I don't care if you're trained or if you're untrained. If there is an event, one of the first commonalities we're going to have is startle and fear. I can have the best training in the world, but when I'm sitting in my office, I hear gunshots, I smell gunpowder in the air, and I hear people screaming. It scares me, it startles me. I didn't come to work today expecting this, and I sure as heck didn't sign up for this. All right, so startle and fear becomes the first uh, commonality, but that's the only commonality. Because once we've trained how we respond, compared to the tr response of somebody who didn't train, are so different. You know, when I'm trained and prepared, I've gone through the classes, I've gone through the exercises, I've participated, I've done the hands-on. I'm gonna have anxiety. None of us expected this to work. We didn't come to the hospital, we didn't come to this facility, we didn't come to this community expecting something like this to happen. But once we dealt with the anxiety, our training kicks in. You know, our brain is an incredible hard drive of data storage. And we go through these training programs. We may not remember it verbatim a week later, but it's locked into that memory bank. And boy, I'll tell you what, when the event happens and you've been through the training, your brain kicks into gear. I mean, you go in and you retrieve that data off your hard drive. Beep, 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 beep. It's right around the front, back right in the active memory. You'll be amazed what you will recall from your training when the rubber meets the road. And if you recall it, then you're going to perform the way you've been trained. That's why it's so critical that everybody participates in the training. And I didn't say sits through the video, I said it participates in the training. The opposite though is that person who's untrained and unprepared. They're not gonna have anxiety, they're gonna have a panic. They're gonna have a panic attack at times. They'll become frozen with fear, disbelief, denial, the things we talked about early on in this program today. But they're going to stay frozen in shock and denial. They're not able to help you. They become a liability to you. So there's just so many reasons why, you know, to make sure people are going to training uh, and doing it. And guys, again, remember, trust your gut. In today's world, if it sounds like a gunshot, it is a gunshot until it's proven to be something else. You're just at the point in our society today that's the world we live in. Now, I talked a minute ago about the four outs. I want to look at those real closely, uh, and I'm cognizant of our time. Uh, but I want to look at those a little bit closer. First one, you know, when we talk about get out, or under, you know, as I said, with run, hide, fight, there'll be run. We want to run. We want to move quickly. We want to get out the exit. And we have to have, and here's an OSHA requirement, in your uh, emergency response plan, if you're leaving the building, you have to have a designated reunification area to go to. Right. People need to be reminded and trained also, leave your belongings behind. You don't need your purse. You don't need your, your briefcase. You don't need your clipboard. You don't need your iPad. Get out. This is about survival. We're working with adults for a, a lot of the cases. Not everybody's going to want to leave. You can't force anybody to leave. You know, it's no different than for years when I was a hospital risk manager. Uh, when I first started a tornado plan at the hospital I was at at the time, said that if there was a tornado in the immediate vicinity of the hospital, stop any visitors from leaving. We said, well, wait, we can't do that. We don't have the right to do that. You know, we can't force somebody not to go outside just because there's bad weather. And you stop somebody at the door and say, I'm sorry, you can't leave because there's bad weather. And they've got children at home or something they've got to get home to. You're liable to get punched in the nose. So, you know, realize you, just because you've got an emergency situation in the building, you can't force somebody to leave. They can choose to stay and hide if they want to. All right, so don't wait for others to agree. You might have to just think about yourself. And, and use the nearest exit that's away from, known, you know, and this is so critical, know where the subject's at in the building. 
know where the bad guy's at, and use the closest exit away from where the bad guy is at. You know, the faster you, you move and get out, the lower the probability you're going to get shot. It's almost impossible for a bad guy to hit a moving target. I, you know, police officers, trained professionals who I have the utmost respect for, you know, they'll go on the range and they'll score marksman, expert, everything, every time. But you get them out into a live engagement against a moving target who may probably is shooting back at them, their actual engagements, their, their hit rates on their shots is only about one out of every four or five shots. So if the experts with the firearms, the trained professionals, are only hitting one out of every four or five, how often do you really think the bad guy is? You know, this isn't Hollywood where the bad guy never misses and he hopes we got all kind of cockeyed angles and everything else. That's fantasy world. That's meant to sell television commercials. That's not reality. Most bad guys are very bad shots, and unless they're close up, they're not going to hit you. So the farther you are away, the better off you are. As soon as you're out, Start calling 911. Guys, do not write a plan that says so and so is responsible to call 911. In this situation, I want everybody calling 911. No such thing as too many calls to 911. Right? Don't assume others have called. If, again, if the system's overloaded and you get a busy signal, keep trying. Right? Because we need to get the police as much information as we can. And I'll bet every one of those callers can tell, can tell the police something they didn't know from the last call. When you're calling, you're going to ask for pertinent information. The name of the shooter, if it's known. Physical description, if it's known. The location of the shooter, if it's known. And the top number and type of weapons, if it's known. And when we talk about the number and types of weapons, don't worry about, oh, I think it's a Glock 45. No, don't worry about that. It's either a handgun, which means it's held in the hand, or it's a long gun, which means it butts up against the shoulder when you shoot it. That's all they need to know. He's got a handgun. He's got three handguns and a long gun, whatever. If we can't get out, we can go to hide to step B, which is hideout in our four outs. Right? If we're hiding out, we're going to use offices, conference rooms, medication rooms, record rooms, whatever, and we're going to hide out in those rooms. We want to make sure we turn off the lights, close the blinds. We want to be as quiet as possible. If you've got a cell phone, silence your cell phone. Turn the ringer off. Turn the vibration mode off. Don't let the bad guy know you're in there. Try to spread out in the room as much as you can. We don't want to all huddle into one little corner and all of us be locked up in one little pocket back there. You know, if possible, you can lock the door, add some barricades. You know, you're in the Xerox room, the copier room. Go ahead and, and uh, slide the uh, uh, copier machine in front of the door. Slide a file cabinet in front of the door. You know, in Hollywood, the bad guy's going to kick down the door or shoot down the door. In the real world, that's not going to happen, right? Locked doors, barricaded doors, that guy's going to move on to the next door. He's looking for targets of opportunity. He's looking for potential victims. He doesn't have time to put down his gun and try to push against that door that's locked or try to kick through a door that's locked. You know, again, that's Hollywood. When we talk about keeping out, uh, you know, keeping out's the third step. Keeping out is what run, hide, fight doesn't have. Uh, and I'm going to speed it up again because a little bit of this we already talked about. Keeping out is for the rooms where we don't have locks on the doors. Now, one of the things I want you to do in your plan, when you write your active shooter plan, identify the rooms on each floor, each wing, each section, whatever, you know, however you're laid out, that have locks on them. Rooms that we can go into, turn out the lights, lock the doors, make it look like an uninhabited room, and hide people in there. Bathrooms, offices, uh, medical records rooms, medication rooms. Uh, soiled utility room. Anywhere that we can go in, turn out the light, lock the door, and, and the bad guy not know we're in there. Um, rooms, though, like patient rooms, resident rooms, fire doors, we got to come up with a plan B on those. All right, We have to keep the bad guy from getting through those doors. And there are a lot of different ways to do it. If I'm going to barricade my fire doors my, my, in the hallways, uh, you know, magnetically, they're usually hold open, fire alarm rings, and they close. I can't lock them under the life safety code, but I can go ahead. There's a lot of different ways. I can take all kind of furniture and everything else and build what we call a wall of obstruction in front of that door. It may not stop the door from opening. Some of them open opposite directions to one another, so one's always going to open. But what that does, and I'm taking chairs, and I can take desks, I can take lamps, I can take uh, you know, file cabinets, I can take any, any I, big things, small things, medium things, lots of things. 
and build a wall of obstruction. Because what we're going to do is when the bad guy opens the door and sees that wall of obstruction, he's not going to put the gun down and start taking that wall of obstruction apart piece by piece to get through. That's too much time. He knows. He's already fired one shot. People call 911. He's hearing the sirens getting closer. And he's going to keep, he's trying to get as many targets of opportunity as he can before the police get there and put an end to this nonsense. So I promise you, he's not going to sit there and try to waste time when he can't get through. He's going to try to keep going. Same thing if you're inside a patient room, you're inside a resident room, can't lock the door. Take that resident bed, take that patient room bed, roll it up against the door. You got a 400 pound barricade there. Roll it up against the door, lock the wheels. Add some more weight if you can. Put some other stuff on top of it. The, the folding cabinets, the dressers, the, the, the bedside tables, any of that stuff. Add, put it on top. Add more weight. Again, the bad guy, when he finds resistance, he can't move it right away. He's not going to waste time, guys. He doesn't have that kind of time. So find ways to keep out. They make now, as you can see in this slide, they make a lot of different things that are useful for protecting or securing different areas. Now, what we got to watch out for is you got to be careful with the health department because they don't look favorably upon this stuff, even in today's world. I've had some places that said, we've got them, we hide them, we don't tell the health department. I've got other places that say, yeah, we talked to the health department about it. And they said, as long as they're not in any place where a resident or a patient can get to them, they're not going to worry about it because they know what we're up against. So it depends on your local health department, depends on the surveyors you get. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to have something like this, Keep it secured so a resident or patient can't get to it. Make sure you know how to unsecure it so if you need it in a hurry, you can get to it. Make sure your staff all know where it's at, how to access it, and how to use it. The last one on here is the, the final step is takeout. Right? Takeout, uh, you know, that's fight on the Run, Hide, Fight program. I really, uh, and this one I hope it never gets to this, but if it does, you know, we're trapped. The shooter's getting closer. We need a plan to fight back because it's, it's coming down now to the wire on this. You need to plan your attack, know how you're going to protect yourself, look for weapons of opportunity. What are things that you can use? And, you know, here's a homework assignment. When you're back in your workplace, I want you to look around. I'm sitting in my office right now, and I'm looking at different things that are available to me that I could use as a weapon to protect myself right now if somebody walked in my door with the intent on harming me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a lamp on my desk. I have a telephone on my desk. I have a cord on my telephone that would make an excellent choke tool. I have a ceramic coffee cup on my desk. I have a letter opener on my desk. I have scissors on my desk. I have a to-go coffee mug on my desk. I have a ruler in my center desk drawer. I have another lamp on a filing cabinet in my office. I've got, and again, as, as uh, Catherine said in my introduction, <clears throat> I'm a retired firefighter also. So I've got some fire department knickknacks, which are quite heavy, which would make excellent impact tools. You know, none of those were designed to be used as, as weapons by me to protect myself. But I owe it to myself to have a plan to protect myself everywhere I go. So know what's in your office. Know what's surrounding you that you could use uh, if uh, uh, you've got to protect yourself. Commit to the action. If you're trapped in there, You've got to commit, I'm not going down without a fight. Right? It's sometimes hard for medical personnel, for medical professionals to appreciate because we're the ones that are caring for the people who have been involved in the fight, not the ones in the fight. But guys, this person's not coming through the door to scare you. They're not coming through the door to hurt you. They're coming home to make sure you, or excuse me, they're coming through the door to make sure you never go home to the people who love you the most again. You got to be ready to fight back. You got to be ready to protect yourself. Do whatever it takes without hesitation. If you can distract them and get them to look away for a second and then smack them with whatever you're going to use, go ahead, fire extinguisher, whatever, I don't care. When the police get there, and trust me, police are going to come quick and they're going to come in large volumes, lots of cops, and that's a great thing. All right? Comply with what, do what the police tell you to do. Slide says, I'm going to put plain English, do what the cops tell you to do. These are trained professionals. They tra practice this stuff all the time. They know what they're going to do when they get there. They know what they're going to need to tell you to do when they get there. I don't care if they tell you to lie down in a mud puddle. Just lay down in the mud puddle. When it's all over and done with, if you want to ask them, hey, why'd you have me lie down in that mud puddle? Good question. But at that moment, if they 
tell you to lay in a mud puddle, do it. They know why. They just don't have time to explain it right now. If you're leaving the building as the police are arriving, remember, they don't know what the bad guy looks like. They don't know a good guy from a bad guy at this point. So you want your hands high above your head, your fingers spread wide so they can see you're not holding anything that in the slightest way resembles a weapon that could be used against them at some point. Don't shout. Don't point at the officers. I don't care if you know them. I don't care if it's a family member. Don't run to them crying or trying to hug them. Oh, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Okay, you got to help us. Forget it. Let them do And again, as a firefighter, I've worked with so many good police officers in my career. I was so blessed in that regard. Uh, and I've been in a couple of situations where I saw the other side of them. And when they're when they get into a tense situation, they're no longer the people you know. Their mind is going to that of a trained professional law enforcement officer. And, and I could sit and tell stories, and I don't have time, obviously, but I could sit and tell stories about seeing police officers almost go through a personality transformation when the action started, where we were no longer friends. They had a job to do, and don't you dare get in the way of me doing my job, and I'm not going to get in the way of you doing yours. Now do it. And it was scary and impressive at the same time. Do what the police officers tell you. I love this quote. Uh, Sergeant Jim Minninger of Telford, Pennsylvania, and Jimmy worked for us for a number of years after he retired. Uh, but he said a long time ago, he said, if a panic-stricken person runs at an officer and attempts to grab hold, she or he is likely to get knocked on his or her butt or worse. And, and Minnie's right. I mean, uh, if, especially if that officer doesn't know you, he doesn't know if you're running for him or her, if you're coming for their weapon, uh, don't do that. I, just do what they tell you. When the police arrive, you know, if shots are being fired, they're going to move towards a gunfire. Their job is not to come in and treat the casualties. Their job is not to get people out of the building. Their job is to stop the shooter. Because the longer the shooter goes without being stopped, the higher the casualty count goes. Now, if no shots are being fired, then the police are going to go into a more methodical mode where they're going to start searching the building until the perpetrator, the bad guy, has been found. Uh, they may ask you to help them with directions. They may ask you for floor plans. They may ask you to sketch out the floor. Uh, don't be surprised by any of that. If, they, if no shots are being fired at that time and the bad guy is still in the building, it's a little bit more difficult then because they don't know where he's going to be hiding or anything else. Then we talk about recovery. Right? This is the forgotten element, guys. And, you know, I'm not even talking about active shooting. I'm talking about everything in our emergency operation plan. Think about your fire drills. You go in, you do a fire drill, you know, you pick somebody out. Hey, you've discovered a fire. What are you going to do? Oh, well, I'm going to follow the race plan. And they're going to regurgitate the race plan, and you're going to give them a pat on the back for that some point they're going to tell you where the fire alarm pull station is at and you're going to say how do you use that thing and they're going to explain it to you and like another pat on the bat and at some point they're going to say uh, uh when i pull that fire alarm the emergency team is going to come running with fire extinguishers we'll ask them how to use the fire extinguisher and they'll explain the path system to you and another part pat on the back and by now everybody's responded and you say okay everybody good job go back to work we never think about recovery we never think about what happens after there's been an actual event. It's not just go back to work. The whole world just changed. Whether it's a fire, whether it's a shooter, it doesn't matter. Dilbert in this slide does not have a good emergency response or a recovery plan. Okay, hollering help, help is not a recovery plan. We need a plan that's going to help us to do a little bit more. Now, remember in a shooting, it's a crime scene. So you can't even think about recovery until the police are done processing that crime scene, which may take days, weeks, or longer. Excuse me. If we do have a shooting event, think about the different resources you're going to need, because I want you to identify all these in your response plan, your crisis management plan, your emergency. I don't care what term you use. Initiate that plan. Now, let's imagine we have one happen. What are we going to need? Well, obviously, first thing I'm clearly going to need outside of EMS and police is I'm going to need crisis management, you know, crisis counseling for my staff, for my patients and residents, for my family members of my patients and residents, uh, a lot of crisis counseling. Do you already have it established where you're going to find that and how you're going to get that help? Or are you going to be sitting down with the yellow pages when your hands are shaking so bad uh, that you can't even hardly move and you're trying to figure out who you're going to call for, for crisis counseling assistance? Clean up on restoration. Don't make the mistake that I've seen other places make where after a shooting event, they think they can have their housekeepers clean it up. You cannot do that. You need to have a relationship with the AC 
ACTs, Advanced Catastrophic Technologies of the world, with the service masters of the world, with uh, your local cleaning pros who are qualified and certified to do biohazard cleanup. Don't put your employees in that position that they have to clean up after an event like this. Please don't do that. All right? That's another resource you're going to need. Uh, what about security? You may need additional security to augment your own, or if you don't have any security, you're going to need some type of additional security. Do you have a relationship with a guard agency? You can call them and say, hey, I need a half dozen people for the next couple of weeks. That's another resource. What about public relations? What about the media? Do you have somebody who has expertise in knowing how to say the right things to the media at the right time? If not, you want to identify a good public relations firm that you can call on, have it planned out in advance that if we need you, we're going to call you and here's what we're going to need from you uh, so they can do that. Same thing with legal. Contact your insurance agency. Contact your legal counsel. All right. Let them help protect you and guide you. There's going to be so much going on after this event. You know, one of my dearest friends, uh, and I've had the privilege and the honor now of working with the guy so many times, and he just recently wrote a book, and, and I was honored, shocked and honored beyond words to find myself mentioned in his book. Uh, is a gentleman by the name of Frank DeAngelis who was the principal at Columbine High School when they had the shootings there in April of 1999. And, uh, you know, Frank just said, you know, as, as terrible as that day was, the days, weeks, and months following were the worst. So, you know, when we talk about a recovery plan, guys, just because no more shots are being fired, it's not over. It's just starting, right? Recovery is painful. Recovery is consuming. Recovery is emotionally draining. You know, I, I can't think of enough adjectives that, that describe how tough the recovery process is going to be. The more we can do on developing a recovery plan to guide us in advance, the better off we're going to be. Now, the question becomes residents and, and resident safety or patient safety versus personal safety of our staff. How do we decide, you know, do I worry about my patient, my resident? Do I worry about myself and my own family? You know, how do I protect myself? It's going through every caregiver's mind when they talk about this. How do I protect my residents, my patients? When should I act? How should I react? You know, those are tough decisions to make. We can pre-plan those in our minds, but I promise you at the moment of the event, it's going to be nothing like it pre-planned in your mind. We all think we're going to, excuse me, we all think we know what we're going to do at the, well, you know, in advance. But when it's reality, you're not going to, it's not going to be anything like that. We need to be able to plan in advance, though, how to make good decisions. To help us decide between personal safety and patient or resident safety, we develop what we call the Safety Transition Adjustment Formula Protocol. And, and it's really a decision-making model. It's, it, it's a balancing act, guys. It truly is. Your residents and your patients balancing against your safety. Right? It's a hard balancing act, but it can be done. The criticality of it and the success of it, when you first hear, and this goes back to what I said earlier, first of all, when you hear what you think are gunshot wounds, or gunshot wounds, excuse me, gunshots, treat it as gunshots, nothing else. It's not somebody backfiring a car. It's not somebody with firecrackers. It's not somebody slamming a phone book on a desk. It's a gunshot. Where is the shooter in relationship to where you are? Where in the building is the shooter in relationship to where you are? If they're far away in the building, you've got, you know, and that's why it says on the slide, what's the bad guy's location? If they're distant, resident and patient safety comes first. You can start moving your residents and your patients into those rooms that we identified where we could lock people. We can start working as we identified and barricading doors, creating walls of obstruction, building those barricades so the bad guy can't get to us. Because right now he's distant and time is on our side. But, if I'm sitting in my office and I hear that shooter is right around the corner, right outside, I don't have time to do any of that other stuff. I've got to think about my own safety, first and foremost, personal safety. So if the shooter is distant from you in the building, patient resident safety comes first. If the shooter is nearby, your own safety comes first. And guys, you know, I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't envy anybody who has to make that decision. All right, the critical component is time of recognition. Now, when you make that decision about caring about yourself, okay, you're not being selfish. In the fire service, we talk about time. You know, Hollywood makes it look like we rescue everybody. We don't. 
We rescue very few, to be honest with you, right? But in Hollywood, you know, the more dramatic it can be, the more television advertising it sells. So we get to rescue everybody in Hollywood, right? We've got a credo in the fire service. We'll risk a lot to save a lot. We'll risk a little to save a little. We'll risk nothing when there's nothing to save, right? Who's going to rescue the rescuer is what it comes down to. You know, if that shooter is proximal to you and you don't think about yourself first, who's going to take care of those patients and those residents if something happens to you? So that's the way we really have to start thinking about that. All right. So, again, it goes back to time of recognition, making sure that the minute we hear the gunshots, we identify and say, yeah, it probably is or it might be. We're going to treat it as it is until we know otherwise. We're going to, again, where's the bad guy at in the building? Uh, and understand how to make the decision. If they're far away, we can focus on patients and residents. If they're close by, we focus on ourselves. Right? And guys, it's just that easy. All right? As I said, I've said it a couple times, I'll say it one more time, the shooter's looking for casualties. He don't care about you, he doesn't care about your family, he doesn't care what you're wearing, he doesn't care if you're male or female, if you're a parent, a grandparent, it doesn't matter. They just wanna kill. They're just looking for targets of opportunity. If they're even, you know, I said earlier in the presentation, they may be just coming looking for one person. Just like my shooter at that uh, Pine Lake Rehab Center in Carthage, North Carolina. Got served with divorce papers, got some Jack Daniels in him, went to the facility uh, looking for his uh, soon-to-be ex-wife. Couldn't get to her, so then he went into a rage. His whole game plan changed. He morphed from going after a single person to going after everybody and anybody. I've already talked about this, so because of time, you know, I already talked about how to secure the room. Um, so, you know, I, I know we're uh, I'm being cognizant on time. I know we're right about it, our time limit, guys. Uh, I do appreciate, you know, and Catherine, I don't know uh, if we've got time, if you have any questions uh, that have popped up during the program. Uh, First Healthcare Compliance knows that I always welcome, you're always welcome to drop me an email if you have a question or call if you have a question. I tell everybody, we're not your attorney. You'll never get a bill for a 15-minute phone call or a uh, email response. Please don't hesitate. I, my goal is simple. I want everybody to go home safely. So, you know, I, I know we rushed through this. Uh, I've done this program over a four-hour spread and still felt like we're rushing because there's just so much on the subject we can talk about. But uh, I hope we've at least had enough to give you an idea uh, of how to get started putting it all together or how to looking at what you've got put together now and refining it and improving it, uh, as well as having somebody you know you can call if you have questions or, or, or need some direction. So, Catherine, again, I thank you. Uh, as I have so many times, it's always a pleasure to work with you. I think this is the fourth or fifth one of these I've done now with your group, and it's just always a privilege. So thanks for having me, and Catherine. I'll turn it back over to you. Steve, it's always a real pleasure to work with you as well, and uh, you always give us a real sense of assurance um, to know, um, give us an assurance of what we are um, supposed to do and um, uh, a real sense of uh, safety in uh, knowing what we are supposed to do. So I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I Thank appreciate you, that very much. So we do have a few questions here. And uh, if you have a few minutes, um, if you wouldn't mind answering them. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm so, not traveling anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Neither am I. Okay, so um, after being shut down or having furloughed workers, how do we respond if we feel there is an employee who might be a threat? Oh, great question. Um, and this is kind of going to fall back on HR. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the article I did with Dr. Piper recently. We talked about a few different things in that article. Uh, and, and Kevin, I'll be happy to share that article with you if you'd like, so you can share it as you as you need to. Um, great. Thank you. A couple, couple of different things. Uh, I'll send you the link. It's published online. Uh, a couple of different things we can think about. Number one is uh, give the employees knowledge. If you're going to start calling people back, maybe send out a letter to all the furloughed workers explaining to them in advance how the process is going to work. So they're not sitting there with their own uh, interpretations or misconceptions about how it's going to work. Instead, they know what the company's process is going to be. They know if it's going to be phased in or whatever the case may be. If your company does any kind of newsletters, then the same thing there. Go ahead and use that newsletter as a, as a communication medium to, to get the message across to all the workers both those who are working as well as those who are furloughed, what the reopening or, or, or the uh, reintroduction of the workforce back into the building is gonna look like, 
how it's going to be approached, how it's going to be managed. Um, for those employees who don't get called back to work right away, again, as I said earlier, fear causes the anger and the stress. Uh, most everybody by now, I hope, has some type of employee assistance program. Have counselors available to work with the employees to deal with the stress, to deal with the fear, and to manage it until it gets to the point where we can have them call, everybody called back into the workplace. So, you know, these are different resources that we want to use, have available to us, and, and use them uh, to maximize the safety, uh, as physical safety, as well as the emotional health and well-being of everybody. Right. Yeah, hopefully. I, yeah, I know I've seen uh, a few people, you know, on Facebook or whatever, who seem still quite frustrated about different things, you know, about maybe oh, that yeah. they don't have their different checks for this yet, or that they haven't figured out unemployment, or they haven't figured out, you know, different things. So, um, yeah, I know there are oh, you kept, quite a few people who are frustrated. Just hit a great nail on, you just hit a great nail on the head because social media right now is mm -hmm. such a, a frenzy of angry people. Isn't it? I know. Yeah. And, and that anger is contagious. Mm -hmm. And right now, most of that anger is against, seems like state and local governments. But when the workforce starts getting called back, I'm, I'm fearing that we're going to start seeing that anger transferred to employers. Right. Right. So, yeah, great exactly. point. I appreciate it. Right. Uh, so we have another question here. Uh, if we have an employee who is a victim of domestic violence in the home, how do we deal with this in the workplace? I guess you'd have to hear about it first in the first place, but um, yeah, in that, any case. That, so. that's where, yeah, that's really where it starts is, is we have to be notified first. I mean, you know, we watch for obvious physical signs, bruising, swelling, black eyes, those types of things. Uh, but, you know, more often than not, the, the, the abusive spouse is not going to necessarily send uh, the abused spouse to work showing physical signs of abuse. Uh, one of the things we always advocate, now OSHA requires us to have a written workplace violence prevention plan. I'm an advocate to have a subsection of that workplace violence plan that is dedicated to domestic violence, encouraging employees, if they are the victim of domestic violence in the home, to report it in the workplace so that we can protect them, as well as protecting all the other workers and patients and residents and anybody else in the building. So it starts with the reporting. Um, unfortunately, you have to know, I, I say it this way, you have to you encourage them. Although I have seen one hospital out in Virginia a few years ago where their employment manual actually stipulated it that if you were the victim of domestic violence, it was a condition of continued employment that you reported it to HR confidentially. Now, I'm not an attorney. I don't know how legal that is. Uh, but I, I know what the hospital is trying to accomplish, and I think it's fantastic. They want to know so that they can protect the abused employee as well as everybody else in the building. But then also in that domestic violence plan, identify different things that you can do to protect that worker. Security escorts in and out of the building, special parking places uh, up close to the building, up close to, the, to, a, to an entrance exit door, uh, shifts that are working when, when maximum staffing is on site, you know, things we can do to protect the employee as well as everybody else. But it really, yeah, Catherine, you just hit that nail on the head, man. You've heard me too much now. You're an old pro at this. Uh, I'm not even going to be getting calls anymore. You're going to be doing these. Um, but, uh, you know, it starts, it starts with notification. And we really have to make sure our employees know how critical it is and that they understand we're not trying to be nosy or snoop in their personal business. We're trying to protect them. Yeah. And that's, that's difficult because um, people in those uh, situations, um, you know, of course, you have to have a certain amount of trust. So, right. And that's and difficult we don't want as well. People, we don't want our coworkers doing our dirty laundry. Mm -mm, not at all. Not at all. So that's, yeah, difficult situation all around. Um, okay. So we have another, another uh, question here. So um, uh, you of course have had uh, other presentations and I've, encourage our listeners uh, if they are new to our webinars to go on to our, our YouTube site or our, or onto our web page uh, and to take a look at those presentations. But um, you've talked about, I know, diffusing aggressive behavior. How does this tie in to um, dealing with an armed person? Should we try to diffuse the, the um, armed person or not? Could you remind us about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. 
no correlation between the two. Um, you never want to try to diffuse an armed person. You never want to approach an armed person. You want to go the opposite direction of the armed person. And that's a great question, Catherine, because, yeah, in the, in the aggression management program, we do teach uh, how to diffuse, how to verbally diffuse a person whose anger is escalating, whose behavior is escalating. But a person with a, a firearm, an armed intruder, an armed person, totally different environment, totally different situation. Uh, we want to go the opposite direction. We want to get as far away from them as we can. Don't ever try to talk down an armed person. Mm, okay. All right. All right. Wonderful advice. Do you have any other words of advice for us or, or things that you want to leave with us? Uh, stuff for us to know. I know you have so many great stories. I'd love to, to hear all of them, but um, do you have any, any other stuff you want to leave us with? You know, I guess the fact that everybody's mind is on COVID right now. Um, you know, none of us know what it's going to look like when this is over. None of us know what it's going to look like as we start to go back to work, as we start to reopen our, our states, as we start to reopen our counties, as we start to reopen our businesses. Uh, so, you know, be prepared for the unexpected. And, you know, it's a great time to be reviewing your emergency operation plans uh, and, and to be trying to think outside the box of things that might be coming down the pike that we've never had to think about before. So, you know, that, that being said, I think that's really it. This is the time to be really focusing on preparedness because uh, when people come back, who knows how it's going to be? I mean, uh, we're going to see all kinds of new stressors. We're going to have families coming back who have been trying to survive on unemployment benefits and, and small stipends from the government and things like that. They're going to be buried in, in new debt that they never had before, whether it's credit card debt or delinquent mortgage payments, delinquent car payments, whatever it could be. All kinds of new stressors are going to be coming back into the workplace. So it's time for us now to start thinking uh, as leaders, how are we going to be prepared to deal with that and to help them to deal with that? Mm, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, all the new debt and the fluctuations of the stock market and all those, yeah, all, yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, all kinds of things, exactly. So, right. as always, I'm the bearer of such good news. <laughs> of course. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on and discussing discussing this today. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I want you Always to make sure you stay safe, stay safe as well. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That means a lot. And I hope you and your family are safe as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye-bye. Uh, yes, thank you. And attendees, please use the contact information on the screen for any questions. And please send us any questions uh, further and we'll forward them on to Steve. Please remember your PACOM and your PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. You'll get it automatically. Uh, don't forget to download the slides as well. You can do that, uh, recall, on the sidebar or on the upper um, uh, bar there. Uh, there's a button. Uh, you can register for any future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com, or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.